All right, here we are. We're live. All right, just give me a second. We're going to do one new little thing. And there we go. We even have closed captioning. Hi, how you guys doing? I did. Um, obviously, I know I can't hear you. Um, feel free to, uh, if you're uh, registered into Twitch, uh, type something into the chat. Let, kind of let me know who's all here um, and participating. All right. So, um, all right. So we're just going to kind of get used to this whole new format here. All right. Sierra is here. Excellent. Anybody else? That's all right. Oh, so welcome to new life. All right. Okay, so, um, all right, well, we're just going to kind of hang out for just a little bit here, uh, give people a couple more minutes to uh, get checked in, and then we're going to kind of start things up. Um, just some general information. I don't know how well you've been getting emails from the district or anything, but at this point, there has been no indication of how long we're going to extend this time period. Um, so officially, we're supposed to return to normal classes after spring break. Uh, but to be honest, my impression is that this could go on quite a bit longer. We might even end up doing remote classes for the rest of the semester. That is not an official statement by the school. That's only my personal speculation at this point. So just, uh, just kind of be prepared for that. And as I get information, I will definitely forward it and pass it on to everyone. Uh, just some other general class business. I just want to commend everybody for um, getting uh, your last lab quiz on time. And, um, you know, we'll just kind of progress that way. Um, all right, um, Alexander has the question, how will this affect the uh, final project? That is a big question. Um, again, if I get any information that this is going to extend um, our remote learning, then I'm thinking the um, group project is just out the window, honestly. Uh, there's just really no practical way to do it uh, with all of the recommendations so that we completely minimize our contact with other people um, and definitely um, minimal access to lab facilities and things like that. So I am definitely considering just outright canceling the project uh, should that become necessary. All right. Um, so please stay tuned and again I will have announcements out on Canvas and pretty much everything else. Uh, Alright, okay so we're a couple of minutes into this so I think it's time to go ahead and we're going to just kind of start the lesson. Alright, so um, oh, actually before I do that, again uh, just a reminder that today is a day to um, work on exam number two. Um, hopefully you've been uh, very busy with these little bit of extra time off preparing for all of your questions, studying up really hard. So hopefully once you log into that and start it, you'll be able to finish within that three hour window that you've been given. Um, it'll probably take me a little longer to grade all of those um, on top of all of the extra preparation that I have to do just to maintain classes here. Uh, there's a good chance I probably won't have grades on exam two uh, up and available until sometime like during spring break. Um, just to let you know that I'm, there might be a little more of a delay than I normally would have. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, start for our next unit. And our next unit is really kind of themed around reproduction, all right? That is the continuity of life. And the ultimate basis for the continuity of life is really cell division. You know, if cells are the basic units of life, then it stands to reason that in order to make more life, we need to make more cells. And so um, we're going to look at kind of one of the foundational processes for making new cells and specifically making new eukaryotic cells. And we'll be talking about this thing called the cell cycle and specifically about the process known as mitosis. So that's kind of my goal for today is to get all of that set up. And then on next lecture coming back on Monday, um, we're going to look at a companion cell division process known as meiosis. And of course, both of those topics are covered in the lab this week. Um, hopefully, um, once you get through today and 
everything that we've explained will give you a little bit better context for how to complete your labs. I also do have a lab video set up um, that is available in the pages section of Canvas. So if you look on all of your links there on the left side of your Canvas page, um, you'll see one that says pages. And if you click on that link, uh, then you'll be able to open that up. I should probably have that up and demonstrate for you, but uh, and that'll take too long to kind of open it all up. Um, it shouldn't be too hard to find. It's the only page right now, and through that you will then see a video that you can open up, and it's about a half hour long. It'll walk you through all of the procedures for getting through uh, the lab, and then you'll be able to submit your lab review questions um, by the end of the day come Monday. All right. All right, so let's start with our chapter here. Chapter 12 is all about the cell cycle. All right, so the question is, is why do cells need to make new cells? Well, for the most part, there are sort of three very fundamental principles. One, of course, as we just talked about, is reproduction. This is where um, new cells always come from, is simply by taking an existing cell and splitting it into two new cells. And if you're a single cell organism, um, kind of like these um, amoeba cells, which find my cursor. There it is. All right. All right, so you can see up here at the top here. So here we have a couple of amoeba cells that are being produced. Originally, this was one big cell that is now in the process of dividing itself into two new pieces. And if you're a single-celled organism, this is your only option for making new cells because you are what you are. And so um, it involves obviously replicating all of the genetic information contained within the nucleus and then kind of separating all of those uh, pieces of DNA out from one another and then just split the cytoplasm in half. All right, so that's how new cells are made. All right, but other functions, okay, include things like growth and development. So this is what multicellular organisms use cell division for is to add to new cells to get larger and to increase uh, the, the amount of tissues or other structures that are. And of course, this is important in our early embryonic development because um, all of us started life as a single cell. When an egg cell got fertilized by a sperm cell, it created one unique new cell called a zygote. And then that zygote begins to divide over and over again and transforms itself into an embryo, which then develops into us. Okay, so we have that. And then as we go through our life, <clears throat> you know, cells do wear out. Not all cells live, are a part of an organism for its entire life. And so in order to replace worn out cells, new cells have to constantly be regenerated. Now, depending on the organism and your kind of evolutionary history will determine which cells are going to uh, need to be replaced. So for example, as humans, we have our external surface of our bodies is our skin, and our skin is constantly eroding and kind of flaking off and then new cells are produced in deeper layers of the skin to replace the old cells um, that have kind of worn off of our surface. And so that's our kind of our regeneration of our skin. It's an ongoing process. Actually, some studies have indicated that um, you probably replace your entire skin over the space of about every three months. All right, all of the current skin cells that are in, on the surface of your body right now, all of them will be gone and eroded off in about a three-month period. I always thought that was kind of fun, too, because I've always felt like I could make a bundle as one of those big motivational speakers, you know, you know those guys who say, I'm going to transform your life by doing this, this, and this. Well, I could start my whole speech by guaranteeing that you will be a new you in only three months. And I won't be lying, because... At least you'll have an entirely new skin in three months. All right, kind of lame, kind of crazy. All right, but that's some of the things that cell division sort of done, does for us. All right, so let's kind of take a look now and let's talk about the actual cycle that cells tend to go through. All right, so 
The cell cycle really kind of represents the entire history of the life of a cell um, from when a new one is produced from a cell division event until that cell then divides itself into two new cells. So that's kind of considered it's kind of the lifespan of a cell, although that has to be qualified a little bit, and we'll get to that in just a second. All right, so what's interesting is that 90% of the lifespan or at least the existence of a specific cell is spent in something referred to as interphase. All right, now interphase is always thought was kind of a lame term because, you know, inter just kind of means between. So it's kind of like saying it's a between phase. You know, it's almost like a euphemism talking for, you know, you know, people who are, you know, have been in long-term unemployment, you know, it's like saying you're between jobs kind of a thing. And it's you know, it's kind of like you're not doing anything. And that, I think, is a bad connotation when it comes to interphase, because if anything, interphase is probably some of the most active periods in the existence of a cell. It's not just sitting there not doing anything, waiting to divide. It's actually doing its real job or its business as a cell. All right, so we can actually kind of divide up interphase into three subphases or periods um, that can be defined by different levels of cellular activity. Right. So the first one is referred to as, again, a kind of a bad term, gap phase. You know, a gap is like an emptiness, you know, it's like there's nothing there. And I don't really personally care for that kind of term. Um, and so there's like this first what is referred to as a gap phase, or more commonly, we just call it the G1 phase. And this is when the cell is kind of doing its normal job, performing its basic metabolism to stay alive. Uh, providing function, especially if it's one of the specialized cells uh, of a multicellular organism. So we're saying like, you know, this is like one of your liver cells. Then it's busy doing the things that your liver does, which is helping to remove toxins from the body, synthesize all kinds of organic compounds, um, make materials that are aiding in the process of digestion, that kind of stuff. Um, so gap one is when it's just kind of doing its normal job for you. All right, um, the cell is also growing, so it's kind of adding new materials. It's part of its metabolism is adding new proteins and other structures. Um, and particularly, it's also getting ready to make all the proteins that are gonna be needed for the next portion of interphase. All right. This next portion is referred to as the synthesis stage. All right, but the synthesis is specifically talking about the synthesis of chromosomes in the nucleus. All right, actually duplicating all of the DNA kind of in anticipation and preparation for doing cell division. All right. So this is going to be kind of a long period, and we are going to have an entire unit devoted toward understanding exactly how DNA is copied. Right. That's kind of our last unit of the semester. Um, but that, the, those events are usually happening here during this S phase. All right, and then after S is kind of finished, then the cell moves on into what we call the gap two or G2 phase, all right? And so this is where, again, the cell really gets down to business, getting ready to divide itself in half, because not only do we need duplicated chromosomes and all of the information to run our new cells after we split the current cell in half, but obviously each new cell is going to need a whole set of organelles. It's gonna need its own mitochondria, a bunch of endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi bodies, lots of ribosomes, you know, all of those contents of a eukaryotic cell um, need to be kind of produced in sufficient quantities so that our new, um, new cells are going to be made available. All right. So that's kind of, again, 90% of the cell's existence is spent in these phases. All right. So what about the remaining 10%? Well, and that's actually doing the specific events of what we call the mitotic phase, all right? Now the mitotic phase refers to actually two different processes that are happening. Um, one starts and then the second one finally gets underway even before the first one is over yet. Okay, so the first portion is the actual process of mitosis, all right? Now the term mitosis is often kind of used synonymous for eukaryotic binary fission, okay, that is the 
splitting of a eukaryotic cell into two new cells. But a little more precisely, mitosis is about the division of the nucleus itself. Right? And again, really the sorting and the separation of these duplicated chromosomes. And it has to be kind of a very highly organized process in, in order to ensure that each new resulting cell, what we refer to as a daughter cell, has the complete set of chromosomes and a complete set of instructions for being able to function. All right. So mitosis is really going to, we're going to spend a lot of time um, looking at what happens with chromosomes and the way that they are kind of altered and changed to facilitate this ease of sorting and then separating them. And we'll look at all the mechanics of that. All right. Now, in addition, though, to mitosis, which is all about just dealing with the contents of a nucleus, but then there is the second process of cytokinesis. All right. Cytokinesis is the actual division of the cell, the kind of the splitting of the cytoplasm into two parcels. And there are different mechanisms by which that happens. And just for simplicity's sake, we're going to focus on how things happen between animal cells and plant cells. Uh, but if you go on into some upper division biology classes and especially study some of the wider diversity of life forms, you may learn that cytokinesis works in some different ways depending on the, the classification of an organism that we're dealing with. All right. So, kind of getting into this, okay, one of the more important concepts about the cell cycle is the fact that it needs to be pretty well controlled. All right. And so, actually, let's take a look here real quick. All right. So, you can see on the illustration over here that, again, we can kind of begin interphase when a new cell has been produced by cell division. And again, it just kind of goes through time, gap one. S phase, gap two, and then the mitotic phase with both mitosis and cytokinesis. All of that happens there. But as I was just saying, there needs to be a good deal of kind of control of this process. You know, in order for um, cells to kind of manage their life and just kind of, well, to make sure that this doesn't happen too quickly or too prematurely before the cell is kind of ready to make two new daughter cells. There are certain points during interphase and even one during the mitotic phase where the cell kind of takes a pause and kind of makes sure that certain levels of business have kind of been attended to. Because if not, then we run the risk of making abnormal cells that are not gonna survive or not going to be able to function. All right, so it's interesting is that generally, the reason that the diseases that we call cancers form is that there has been a failure in some of these um, checkpoint systems. And generally what happens in cancers is that cell division happens in a very uncontrolled fashion, producing large numbers of very abnormal cells that then can spread through an organism and begin to interfere with normal tissue and organ processes. And so this is the why cancer is actually such a difficult disease to treat is that the control mechanisms themselves um, involve a lot of interrelated proteins. And there's lots of proteins that are working in conjunction and working in um, what are called cell signaling systems, uh, something that we're going to cover um, more towards the end of the, the uh, semester here in chapter 11. So I'm not going to kind of have you guys learn all of this just at this time. You don't have the background necessary. Uh, to fully understand the um, signaling systems that regulate um, the cell cycle. But there are a lot of interrelated proteins, and of course, anytime you get a mutation in those protein structures, they're not going to work right, and so you lose these control mechanisms, and cells can then begin to reproduce in a very uncontrolled and irregular fashion, and you get just these bizarre, non-working types of cells. Um, all right, so there, there needs to be kind of um, a certain series of checkpoints, all right? And in the study of most eukaryotic cells, there are kind of considered to be three major checkpoints that the cell kind of passes through. Um, 
and it's really a matter of the cycle is sort of an automatic cycle it's just kind of on its own natural timer but then these checkpoints are kind of pauses in the cycle where the cell can kind of assess the presence of specific signaling proteins that either say yes we're good to go and we can move on into the cycle and we can go to the next stage or we need to take a pause until things are actually prepped and ready to go and as we're going to see one of these checkpoints there's even one where it can just stop the cell cycle from continuing on and the cell is simply not going to divide all right so let me kind of walk you through these major checkpoints and kind of simplistically we're going to kind of address what what needs to be addressed by these checkpoints in the form of sort of quote unquote questions that the cell is trying to ask okay so there's one major checkpoint in the G1 phase, kind of about two thirds or three quarters of the way into the G1 period. The cell kind of has a checkpoint where it's effectively asking two questions. One, is the cell starting to grow large enough to be able to successfully divide? Is it going to kind of have enough basic cytoplasm and materials so that after we split the cell in half, are we going to have enough raw materials to continue to work with and keep the two new daughter cells alive? All right. So kind of is, has there been sufficient growth is kind of another way of phrasing that question. All right. And then the second thing is that it actually kind of checks and inspects from the previous round of cell division, kind of using proteins to examine the structure of the DNA and make sure that there aren't any major structural problems with the DNA in the nucleus. Because again, if our instruction book has major errors or issues with it, then potentially one, if not both of our daughter cells are not gonna be able to successfully function. So we're gonna kind of inspect the DNA and make sure that it's not horribly damaged, all right? Now this is not to say that minor little changes and errors in the DNA structure haven't kind of made it through the system, but as long as, you know, there aren't any major like broken fragments or missing pieces or anything like that, that's kind of what we're looking at in G1, the G1 checkpoint. Okay, there's another one that happens almost at the very end of the G2 checkpoint, all right? And this is like well after the synthesis phase, but it does take time for this to be assessed, which is, did the S phase work successfully, all right? That is, were the chromosomes actually duplicated or not? Because if they weren't duplicated, there's no point in trying to split the cell and go into the mitotic phase, because right? there's nothing to work with the way the mitotic phase is supposed to work with. All right, so again, so it's going to take a look at that, make sure DNA replication actually happened. And again, are there any major structural issues um, with those duplicated chromosomes now that they've been produced? All right, so again, kind of double checking and making sure everything is good to go. All right, once the cell has kind of determined, okay, we made it through G2, okay, and now it begins the process of mitosis, there's still one last checkpoint. All right. And this is during the mitotic phase, so we call it the M checkpoint. And really it's just asking for one thing, and we'll, we'll get into this in the specifics in just a little bit. But the question is, are the chromosomes actually attached to special microtubules called spindle fibers that are going to guide the movements of these duplicated chromosomes and making sure that they move to the appropriate areas of the cell. Um, again, they kind of form like a track or a pathway that the chromosomes are going to move along, but they need to be connected in the first place. So if these are not connected properly, then probably shouldn't proceed with the remaining phases of mitosis until this has uh, been accomplished. Now, again, we're going to talk about maybe in a, a later um, unit here that sometimes this doesn't always happen perfectly and that can lead to um, cells with missing or extra chromosomes and we'll deal with more of that um, in a few more chapters and we kind of talk about the relationship between chromosomes and inheritance of traits and characteristics and particularly the inheritance of certain um, disorders um, so we're going to kind of come back to that concept in a few weeks all right. Now, again, I mentioned is that these checkpoints are places where the cell kind of takes a pause or takes a moment of assessment. Um, but this G1 checkpoint has turned out to be very specific in its importance because some cells never get the signal to progress past the G1 checkpoint. All right. And at that kind of moment, 
what happens is the cells simply go into a new phase, something referred to as the G naught phase. All right. Um, not is spelled N-A-U-G-H-T, okay, meaning like zero without value. So it's more like maybe you can think of it as the G zero phase. All right, and so what does that mean? Well, it simply means that the cell is no longer going to progress through a cell cycle. It's going to remain in its current form. It's not going to divide, and it'll just exist like that for the remainder that it can, as long as it's not... Uh, damaged by outside forces or accidentally poisoned or, or something like that, the cell will probably persist for the life of the organism. So we have lots of cells in our bodies that go into this g naught phase, things like muscle cells and, yes, brain cells. Brain cells definitely uh, exist in that g naught kind of phase um, because they need to be able to continue to function and, stay, and remain stable in their, their networks and their pathways in our brain. So absolutely, um, and again, lots of other cells um, that are more or less permanent cells. Um, and if you know we lose those cells, then we kind of lose the functions that those specific cells were doing. Um, now it's not to say that when we lose neurons, we lose brain cells, that other cells can't kind of make up for the damage. You know, we've seen that happen in stroke victims. Um, who have suffered regional brain damage, but then with therapy and time, they can overcome some of the limitations due to the loss of those brain cells as the, as the surviving brain cells are able to form new pathways and new connections that will um, allow for the regaining of at least some functions, maybe not 100%, but um, good therapy can often help a lot of stroke victims that way. All right. So, again, if you want to take a look at kind of here's what um, the G1 checkpoint kind of looks like, uh, or sorry, look at them, them as, again, kind of about three quarters of the way uh, through the G1 phase right here. Again, these control systems, these are the molecular systems inside the cytoplasm of the cell, all these different proteins that are interacting. Again, they're kind of on autopilot, and they just kind of move continuously until they run into a checkpoint, which kind of represents a barrier, and then these kind of um, traps can then just kind of open up and allow the process to continue on into the next phase. All right, so again, this is the critical G1 that either the cell passes through it or it goes into the um, G0 phase. And then you can see here the G2 checkpoint is right at the end of the G2 phase and is the kind of the guardian to make sure whether or not we really need to go into mitosis or not. And then you've got the M checkpoint. So this is that um, during something called metaphase. And that doubles checks to make sure that all the chromosomes are properly connected to their spindle fibers. All right. So with that kind of background, then, let's go ahead and take a look at the actual process of mitosis itself. All right. So again, mitosis is, is where all the kind of the, the real busy action is happening here. And there's a lot of kind of processes that are happening. All right, so um, the way your textbook kind of lays it out is sort of a new understanding of mitosis, um, which is that mitosis is nowadays being thought of as consisting of kind of five distinct phases. All right, now let me kind of caution you. The phases really represent snapshots in the process. Um, the actual process of preparing the nucleus and dividing all its contents up is a smooth and fluid activity. All right. So these stages just kind of flow easily from one to another. And it's not like the cells take a pause in the middle of each one and just kind of sit around so that we can examine them and, and things like that. It's just a matter of there were definitely certain cellular characteristics that are very easy to recognize. Um, and we just kind of have labeled them. So to a certain extent, the labels are a little bit arbitrary. And um, again, kind of this is sort of, so these five phases represent sort of newer thinking. Way back when I was a student, we only had four phases. Um, and even your own textbook gets a little inconsistent because when we go into our next chapter and look at the topic of meiosis, they kind of drop the equivalent version of one of these phases from the discussion. So uh, try not to get too caught up in what's going on here. But I want to be consistent with the resources that we have available to us, so I'm going to go ahead and present this as five phases.
All right, so you've got a initial phase referred to as pro phase. And again, the pro phase, the prefix pro just kind of means before or beginning um, at the start. And so of course this will be the kind of the initial and the starting part of the process for mitosis. And then there's, here's the new one, all right? They kind of call it pro metaphase. And for a lot of folks though, this is just a continuation of prophase itself. And even in some references um, a few years back, they used to kind of divide up prophase into an early prophase and a late prophase. And then I guess the decision was to call early prophase just prophase. And, and then call the late prophase this new thing called prometaphase, which is sort of saying it's in between prophase and the next stage after that known as metaphase. All right. So the word meta, meta just kind of means above or beyond. And so we've gone from our before phase, and now we're going beyond the four phase, which is kind of weird. All right. And then we get to anaphase. All right. Anaphase is actually kind of the big deal. It's kind of the main purpose of mitosis here, because it's actually during anaphase that you're actually going to see the physical separation of the copies of chromosomes from one another. Um, and then finally there's telophase, or basically the end phase, or the far phase, all right? Um, so then this is where the cell kind of tidies up the process and kind of undoes some of the changes that had to be made to get us into and to perform mitosis in the first place. Okay, so these are the phases, and um, we're going to kind of go through these uh, one at a time and talk about all of the significant uh, changes and details uh, that happen with them. All right. Now, as we showed you earlier, that this mitotic phase is mitosis itself, but then there's also the separate process of cytokinesis. And cytokinesis, again, is the splitting of the cytoplasm of the cell that should only happen after chromosomes have been separated from one another. All right. The thing is, is that cytokinesis kind of occurs around the same time that mitosis is still happening, just a little bit later. Generally, and it, it's, it's unclear exactly when um, cytokinesis gets started. It probably begins um, at least somewhere in anaphase and then often becomes visible as a process during telophase. And again, we're going to kind of go through a little bit some of the mechanisms for doing that, and those mechanisms vary uh, between plants and animals. All right. Okay, so... Again, we've got a couple of uh, images from the textbook that provide kind of some clean illustrations of what's happening. And so we kind of take a look here. Again, some of the big differences that you're going to see are things like um, during interphase, you can always recognize a cell during interphase because the contents of the nucleus are not actually very distinct. You know, you can't actually see individual chromosomes while the cell is in interphase. And that's because all of the uh, chromosomes exist as this kind of looser, um, more thread-like material called chromatin. Okay? So if you remember back when we were talking about eukaryotic cell structure and we were talking about the nucleus, I showed you some images of how DNA is organized around uh, sets of proteins, and then those proteins coalesce together and kind of wind up and fold up the DNA into slightly more condensed portions. Um, chromatin is sort of kind of one of, the, one of the least condensed versions of um, DNA because the DNA needs to be kind of loose and available to all of the different proteins that are responsible for reading um, and regulating the genes that are contained within them. All right. But what this means is that it has to be spread out throughout the nucleus, and so you can't distinguish necessarily one uh, chromosome from another, and so it looks uniform. About the only thing that you can see distinct inside the nucleus of a cell in interphase is that you might find dark little bodies that are the nucleoli. All right, a nucleolus, again, is one of those organelles that is responsible for putting together ribosomes um, before they can be released out into the cytoplasm for use in protein synthesis. All right, so that's kind of what we're looking at here. All right. Um, other structures kind of to take note of is in animal cells, there were those organelles called centrioles. We've talked about those. Um, 
and if we're at the G2 portion of interphase, then even the centrioles have been replicated. And so there are now two pairs of centrioles. And these are going to become very important as they become a structure known as a centrosome. All right. Okay, so moving into prophase then. Um, prophase, um, you'll be able to see some things here like the chromosomes become a little more visible. These things called spindle fibers, which are specialized forms of microtubules, um, are beginning to be produced in association with the centrosomes as kind of an organizing point and location there. All right. Prometaphase, the chromosomes have become even more condensed and are these very distinct visible rod-like structures that are actually consist of pairs of very super condensed chromosomes that are then bound together um, by tiny little structures called centromeres and on the centromeres are key little structures called kinetochores. Right? The kinetochores are kind of the binding sites for these spindle fibers that they will eventually connect to. And again, we're going to go through this a little more step by step. So if I'm going fast, don't worry, we're going to come back and review this again. Yeah. So prophase, and the other big thing that you can kind of distinguish is that while there might still be a bit of nuclear membrane in prophase, that membrane has begun to radically dissolve and there's only little fragments left of it. Um, so you don't see much of a distinct nucleus by the time you're in prometaphase. Metaphase itself is easily recognized by an alignment of all of our chromosomes kind of along the center of the cell, and they've all been connected to uh, spindle fibers coming from opposite sides of the cell. Okay. Anaphase is when you actually move these duplicated chromosomes, what these things are calling daughter chromosomes, are now being pulled towards opposite ends of the cell. And again, this is kind of the big event. This is what mitosis is really all about, is separating these identical copies from one another. And then again, there's telophase along with cytokinesis. Really, telophase is just kind of reversing the changes. So um, we begin to loosen up the chromosomes back into chromatin, start building new nuclear membranes around, and breaking down the rest of the apparatus. All right, so that's kind of the quick overview of all this. But let's kind of, again, take a look at this. And we're going to use some different images along the way here. So these pictures that we're going to see in the next series of slides, um, all of these pictures are taken through um, kind of some specialized uh, compound like microscopes. But in particular, what they've done is they've prepared the cells with fluorescing compounds that bind to different elements of the cell. So you've got kind of this blue dye binds to the chromatin or the chromosomes so that we're going to see them and make them much more visible. The green binds specifically to the proteins that make up the microtubules or the spindle fibers, so we can kind of keep track of them. And then we've got um, this red stuff is just binding to other proteins that form the cytoskeleton, so things like um, actin fibers and um, um, other microfilaments and that we had talked about before. All right, so when we look again at a cell in interphase, particularly at G2, the cell has made preparations for cell division and it gets the go-ahead signal. Okay, so we pass that G2 checkpoint. So what happens next? All right, so the next part of this again is prophase. All right, so again, we distinguish prophase when the chromatin itself becomes distinctly visible. All right, and we're starting to see thick cords and strands of material still more or less contained within a boundary. So we can still kind of get a sense of where the nuclear membrane is. There are probably enzymes beginning to dissolve and break down the nuclear membrane. It just hasn't progressed very far at this stage. All right. So, but we can begin to distinguish them. They're still kind of spread out throughout the nucleus and they will continue to kind of tighten up and condense themselves into shorter and shorter fragments. All right, and we're going to actually come back in just a couple of slides, and we're going to take a look at um, what the chromosomes are going to look like in their final stage. All right, the other thing that we can see here is over here more and more of the green. So we're producing more and more of these spindle fibers. And actually, if you look real close, okay, so our spindle fibers are now being synthesized 
and they are being extended from these two little yellow patches right there. These are the centrosomes. And because this is an animal cell, we can assume that there are centrioles kind of in the heart of them. All right, now I'll talk about kind of what the centrioles are there for yeah, a little bit later. They're kind of a mystery, um, but they are typically located in that region right there. Um, anyways, so essentially these are the structures that are going to be used to provide kind of the guiding pathways for the movements of our chromosomes, and there's some other specialized spindle fibers that have some other roles, and we'll come back and talk about them in some of the later phases. All right, so yeah, sorry, I get ahead of myself sometimes. So again, the nuclear membranes, again, they do begin to dissolve uh, starting in prophase. We just may not see um, a big difference just yet. All right, so moving on from prophase then, prometaphase. All right, so here we can see that the nuclear membrane is more or less completely dissolved at this point. There's nothing really creating a boundary around it. Um, all we can see are individual chromosomes um, that are positioned here. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is that the center of where all of our spindle fibers are connected to, those centrosomes, at this point they have migrated to opposite sides of the cell, representing what we call the poles of the cell. And so we've got some spindle fibers that are extending back, and they're actually going to link to parts of the cytoskeleton as an anchoring point to kind of give you know, a stable foundation for these centrosomes. And then other spindle fibers um, are going to um, reach out, and they are going to bind to our uh, chromosomes themselves. All right, so the spindle fibers that actually bind to the chromosomes are referred to as kinetochore microtubules. All right, because that is where they connect to the chromosomes. They connect on those special patches called kinetochores. All right, and um, you're probably wondering, okay, and they attach to these things called dyads. What does that mean? Okay, I'll get back to that in a minute. I got a little bit out of order when I organized the slides, so my apologies for that. Um, but um, right now we'll, we'll say that the dyads is another term for chromosome, and I'm going to have to come back and explain terminology um, a little bit better. All right, so we're going to connect them, but again, each chromosome needs to have a spindle fiber coming from an opposite pole. So essentially, they're going to be connected on two sides, and they're going to be kind of maneuvered from those two sides, kind of initially pushed from both sides simultaneously, and then later on they're going to be pulled in, along those separate spindle fibers that are going to lead them in opposite directions. All right, so that's kind of what prometaphase looks like. All right, now let, let me clear up a little bit what I've just been talking about here. All right, so when chromosomes become fully condensed by the end of prometaphase. All right. They kind of look like this. So this is an electron micrograph showing all the chromatin that has been super coiled and condensed into these short rod-like structures. All right. And most traditional biology textbooks refer to each of these rods, each of these halves, top and bottom half, as sister chromatids. All right. So they represent identical copies of a chromosome, right? and they are the products of DNA replication. Um, they are only visible like this during the mitotic phase. So this only happens during prophase and prometaphase does the chromatin end up in this tightly coiled and condensed state. So it's the only time you can actually visibly see an individual chromosome is during this period. All right. um, an important feature of the chromosome as it consists of these sister chromatids is that there is a specific portion where you notice that it's a little pinched in, a little narrow. And that's because there are some special proteins here that bind them a little more tightly, forming a structure called a centromere. Right. Now the centromere is important because there are, this is where kinetochores are located, are on the centromeres. And there's a kinetochore for each sister chromatid. Right, so that there's an attachment point on each side, and each chromatid gets one. All right. 
Now here's where the terminology needs to be clarified a little bit because for a lot of students, this gets really confusing because you've got a lot of words that all kind of start the same way. You've got chromatin, chromatid, chromosome, and it can be really confusing and keeping track of it. And especially when if you read through most textbooks, you know, they start talking about chromosomes as either in this state where the, chrom the entire chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids, and then later on in mitosis, they start talking about the individual chromatids as being now chromosomes. And so students get, again, very, very confused about this. So one of the ways that we can cut down on this confusion is that we can abandon a lot of these chromaterms. All right. So instead of talking about chromatids, chromatids can better be called monads, okay, as in mono, mono meaning one, so a one-piece structure. So one chromatid is a monad. The two monads joined together by a centromere then form a dyad. All right. And so that's where in kind of our previous slide, I was talking about how the dyads are then connected to kinetochore microtubule fibers coming from opposite sides of the cell so that they kind of get linked up. Now again, I've got some other uh, slides that will kind of focus in on that and we'll pay a little bit more close, close attention to what's going on. All right. So moving on here. After prometaphase, we now are going to get to metaphase. All right. So in metaphase, what happens is these microtubules are not fully grown to their final lengths yet. As they begin to bind to individual dyads, the microtubules can still be elongated, and as they grow from opposite directions, they kind of push against one another, and they're sort of a, it's like a shoving contest. And initially, if you have a shorter microtubule, it'll maybe be able to push a little harder and a little longer. But eventually, as they both grow, they're going to push all of the dyads into a central plane midway um, down the length of the cell, a region referred to as a metaphase plate. And it causes all the dyads to kind of be spread out in a flat region. So it's not like they're all perfectly lined up in, um, in an ordinary line, the way it often looks like in some of the simpler illustrations. Um, instead, they're a little bit spread out across this flat plane. All right, if you follow my cursor, you can see kind of spread out along here. And all of the tips of the individual monads are now kind of pointed all in different directions right there. All right. But this is essentially what metaphase looks like. All right. So there are these spindle fibers that directly connect to the dyads and push them into place. Now there are another set of spindle fibers referred to as non-kinetochore microtubules. They also grow from the poles of the cell and eventually reach the center, and a bunch of them then begin to kind of overlap each other. And I can show you this a little bit better on this illustration right here. All right, so let me go back and again, emphasize what kinetochore microtubules are doing is that you've got a series of microtubules that grow from the centrosome and they grow up and then are able to bind directly to the kinetochore on the centromere portion of each uh, of each monad. So you get one set of microtubules that are growing along and again connecting here. Um, again it's probably as this illustration would imply, more than one kinetochore microtubule per side, um, but they all kind of are cross-linked and, and work together. All right, and then here's one from the opposite side. And again, it's the growth of these that have pushed all of our dyads into the central plane right here, this metaphase plate, which again, it's not a physical structure, it's just kind of this imaginary zone where everything's going to end up. All right, now the non-kinetochore microtubules so these are microtubules that come from the centrosomes and they grow t in opposite directions and at a certain point they overlap one another. And they also cross connect with special little motor proteins. These are going to come into play a little bit later um, during anaphase because 
to help enhance cytokinesis, it helps if the cell is a little more stretched out and elongated. And so these microtubules are going to actually, later on, they're going to push back against one another. And as they push back, they're going to push the centrosomes further apart from one another. And that effect is going to be to kind of stretch out the cell a little bit. So they're going to have a role more in the cytokinesis side of things than really in mitosis itself. So some other things. So again, this illustration I think makes it kind of nice and clear. We've got a little inset down here showing through an electron microscope how kinetochore microtubules actually bind um, onto the centromere of a chromosome. And again, you've got the kinetochore region on the bottom and another one up here on the top. And again, here's kind of a wider view of a cell view through an electron micrograph. Again, showing all of these structures in a, that are available. All right, so metaphase is just about getting all of the dyads positioned in the center of the cell and making sure this is all aligned. And again, like we mentioned earlier, this is the last checkpoint in the cell cycle. This is making sure that all of our dyads are connected to microtubules coming from opposite sides. And if they're not all connected, we should wait and make sure that they all are. Now, this doesn't, again, always work perfectly. And in some cases, um, one side may not get a proper attachment of kinetochore microtubules. And that'll have consequences because that'll prevent the separation of our monads from one another. And then the cell is going to end up with kind of an extra copy of a chromosome in one of the daughter cells and the other one's going to be missing one and if this is happening in ordinary mitosis it's probably not a huge issue um, except that one daughter cell is now going to be missing a whole bunch of genes and it may not be able to function long enough and it'll just die uh, the one that gets the extra chromosome might be able to get by um, just with the extra genes or it may also end up with some kind of um, catastrophic failure, but all that does is affect like two different cells. It's not a big deal. Things will be different when we get to meiosis and we kind of talk about what happens when we're making egg and sperm cells and you get that same kind of a problem happening. There are bigger consequences to that and we'll talk about that in a later chapter. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about anaphase. All right. So in anaphase, this is actually also a kind of a, a busy time, and there's, there are a lot of aspects to understanding anaphase that we're going to go through here. All right. Fundamentally, though, anaphase is just about the monads start migrating towards opposite poles. All right. So they get pulled from the metaphase plate, and they get pulled from the centromere. And as that pulls them back, that, of course, causes the center part of each monad to go first and the tips of the monads kind of trail behind. So, you know, it would be kind of like, you know, if you were to, um, you know, grab a person around their waistband or their pants or by their belt or something and suddenly just kind of jerk them back. All right. So the waist is going to pull first and then the head and the tail are going to kind of flop forward and kind of trail behind. That's kind of what's happening. Um, with our monads right there. And so the, you get kind of this V-shaped impression to all of them as they start migrating and moving along. Now what's been kind of fascinating and really only understood in just the last couple of decades is really understanding the mechanism of how the monads migrate towards opposite poles. And this is one of those interesting cases where, again, in biology, there seems to always be more than one way to solve a problem. And so there's no hard and fast rule as to how do the monads make this migration. Because some studies have shown that the pulling really is happening at the centrosome end of things. That is, there are motor proteins associated with the centrosome that begin to pull on the microtubules. And as they pull them towards the pole, they dissolve the microtubule in the centrosome region 
and as they continue to pull and pull and pull, that shortens the microtubules, and that's what pulls the monad towards the appropriate side. All right, so this is sometimes referred to as the reeling model because it's kind of like you know fishing, and you're reeling in a fish. So you know you're shortening things at the fishing rod end and pulling the fish in that's hopefully caught onto the hook. So you just kind of reel it on in that way. All right, and a lot of people thought that that was probably the way it should always work, but then some other research has indicated that in other types of cells, the microtubules instead actually shorten at the kinetochore end of things, all right? So basically at the point of attachment where there are all of these proteins that are extensions of the kinetochore itself. And these include motor proteins called dynin proteins that these are similar to um, that one animation I showed you guys in class a few weeks ago showing how a vesicle walks along a microtubule being transported through the cytoplasm of the cell. It was that funny little red protein with like the two big clown feet that kind of shuffled alternating side to side. It's a similar type of protein. All right. And so that walks along our microtubule right in here. All right. And then other enzymes nearby dissolve the microtubule along as it gets pulled along so it doesn't get in the way. Right. So this is kind of weird. This would be like watching a freight train. And as it travels along the track, the track dissolves after the train has passed over it. And the track just disappears. All right. um, another way, the, 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 the nickname for this method is sometimes referred to as the Pac-Man model. If you guys remember the old 1980s video game Pac-Man, the little yellow guy who would you know, eat the dots as he moved across the screen. So it's kind of like, you know, you've got this mechanism here. Actually, I have a kind of a simpler diagram of this model right here. So again, here's our kinetochore, and here are our motor proteins. And then again, they kind of alternately take steps and walk along the microtubule, walk along our spindle fiber, and then the tubulin subunits dissolve or are broken off. And so you shorten the spindle fiber at the end where the chromosome is being pulled along and it moves along until it gets to the poles. All right, so different species and different types of cells use either one of these methods. And I guess one is not necessarily any better than the other because we see both mechanisms out there in nature. So more than one way to solve the problem. Doesn't matter how you solve it as long as you solve the problem. All right. So that's kind of the, the details there. Okay. And then now we can finally get to telophase. All right. Now with telophase, mostly this is about undoing all of the changes that happened during prophase. All right. So in this situation, new membranes are constructed. All right around each group of monads, you know, because now we've separated them out, it's time to get all of the genetic material back under the protection of a nuclear envelope. And so we need to dissolve it. We need to get this, um, or we need to reverse that dissolving. We need to get back under, under construction there so we can protect all that genetic material and then it'll be safe for it to uh, begin to decondense back into its chromatin state because these new daughter cells are going to start need to express all of their genes again so they can begin to resume normal functions and be able to, you know, once we finish with telophase and we get back into interphase, the cell needs to go back to doing its job again. So it's going to need access to all of those genes, which most have been buried up while the um, chromatin was super condoiled up into, into one of those monads. You know, it's just so tightly packed, most of the genes are kind of buried within the mass, can't be accessed. So that's, and that's kind of maybe a bigger picture about mitosis, is that during mitosis, almost all other cellular functions are largely suspended, right? Because there's no genetic control over them. It's just operating on whatever proteins and materials have already been preliminarily synthesized and now ready to go. All right. The only other thing that needs to happen is that any residual or remaining microtubules um, that were used during all of this mitotic process those can now be broken down. Yeah. 
and just again kind of in maybe a, a, a bigger framework and this is kind of a way I've, I've traditionally explained and, and given you sort of an analogy for the whole process of mitosis is mitosis is kind of like moving all right now if you've ever moved all right you know that there are certain things that you need to do in order to have a successful and easy move and one of the early things that you need to do when you move um, is packing right you know you want to condense all of your materials into things that are easier to carry and to load you know into your moving truck or whatever it is that you're using to transport your stuff as you go from your first home to your new home all right so that's what the condensing of the chromatin into the dyads is really all about it's just about making this stuff easier to move you know it's not like when you move you don't just bring a truck up to the house and then start just randomly throwing everything out of your house into the back of the truck you know you'd like to organize it you want to make sure that it's all safe and protected and so condensation during pro prophase is really about that all right second thing you always want when you move you want movers right you want help that's what the spindle fibers and the proteins associated with the kinetic are all about. They are what's going to help you move things around. All right? So just like when you move, you want help. So what do you do? You call up all your friends and you bribe them with pizza and beer and say, please move all my heavy stuff. All right. It's pretty amazing that that works, by the way. You know, I think there are a few things you can't bribe people into doing where they won't respond to pizza and beer. Hopefully you're nodding along with that and going, yep, I've done that. Yeah, I've done that myself many, many times. All right. So moving is kind of a good analogy for those sorts of things. And then the other thing, I guess, about moving. Yeah, exactly. Who would not want free food? You know, especially pizza. Pizza is like the best. Anyways. Um, getting rid of the nuclear membrane in prophase. Honestly, that would be like removing doors to make it easier to get the big stuff out or, you know, even going to the extreme of removing major walls so that it's easier to get things out of the way. Now, again, what's interesting is that some eukaryotic cells, they don't actually dissolve the nuclear membrane when they perform mitosis, and they actually have to pinch the nucleus in half in order to uh, separate um, the monads from one another and so kind of perform something similar to a cytokinesis within the cell before or during the actual splitting of the rest of the cytoplasm itself all right so the dissolving of the nucleus isn't something that is universally seen in eukaryotic life all right all right so back to telophase just for a second again telophase is all about reversing those basic changes right there so you know you begin to unpack all your materials now that they've been moved you dismiss the movers give them their pizza and beer and then kick them out of your house because you don't want all these extra people hanging around um or maybe you do maybe you can put them to work unpacking for you i don't know that would be a really good idea um anyways and then you know build up the walls around everything so that's kind of telophase all right so those are all of the big stages of mitosis um, so the only thing kind of left then really to talk about then is cytokinesis. All right, so cytokinesis works a little bit differently when you're talking about animal cells versus plant cells. All right, in cytokinesis in animal cells, again, generally this starts probably during anaphase, um, although it may not very be, be very visible depending on exactly how early or late in anaphase you are. But what happens is that there are special proteins we call contractile proteins. There are actually two different proteins that interact together, one called actin and another one called myosin. And they get assembled just inside the cell membrane, kind of around the equator of the cell in a big circle. All right. And once those are kind of organized, then as telophase progresses, these proteins kind of contract against one another and as a result, it pulls that circle in tighter and tighter, and it starts to narrow the margins of the outer membrane, creating a um, notch visible around the sides that we call a cleavage furrow. Right? 
And all that happens is that these proteins continue to contract tighter and tighter, narrowing and narrowing, pinching down the cleavage furrow into this little waist-like section, and it just deepens until the cells are just completely separated, because at this point we've constricted, and then the bits of phospholipid bilayer on the membranes, these edges, that maybe you can see right here, okay, these come together and can then confuse into a single membrane, and the two cells are not going to be separated from one another. Yeah. So it's pretty straightforward when you're looking at animal cells because all they have to deal with is that flexible cell membrane which is very easily constricted. All right. Plant cells are a bit different okay? because plant cells actually have a number of differences in mitosis. All right. And actually, here's one of them that's interesting. All right, in plants, they don't have centrioles. Okay, they're they're not present at all. And originally, when centrioles were studied, they were studied in animal cells, and they were always seen associated with forming the centrosome. And as a result, they were thought to be critical to centrosome formation and and the actual uh, assembly of the spindle fibers. And then they started doing some experiments because, well, they noticed that plant cells didn't have them. And so they wondered, are these really necessary or not? So they did experiments where they could go in and basically destroy the centrioles using anything from like laser technology to micro focus a, a laser burst and just destroy those, um, those structures. Or they would look around and they would find genetic mutants of cells that were incapable of producing centrioles. In both cases, what they found out was that centrosomes can still form, spindle fibers still form, and so the centrioles are not even critically necessary for the formation of a centrosome. So we don't really know why they're there. They're there, and maybe the best explanation is that the cell uses them as sort of a, a landmark, letting the proteins that assemble a centrosome know that this is a good place to get started. All right, and so they and they kind of work in, in some of the organization, but they're not critically necessary. And then again, we got confirmation that they're not really necessary because we looked in plant cells, and plant cells don't even have centrioles, and they still make centrosomes, and they still perform mitosis pretty much the same way other eukaryotes do. So you got me. I don't know why they are. They just are there, but they're not required. Okay. The other thing, a couple of other things, just in general. Um, as far as where does cell division typically occur in organisms, in a lot of animals, a wide range of tissues have cells that are capable of performing mitosis on a regular basis. So again, we have it happening throughout um, the outer layer of our skin, what we call our epidermis, even in some of the deeper layers of skin. So there's um, types of tissues that we call connective tissues, where you get regular typical division of cells and making of new cells. Um, even certain parts of our nervous system, certain cells in our brain and our spinal cord undergo regular cell division, that kind of thing. And so it can happen just about anywhere. Plants are a little bit different in that cell division usually only happens in specific regions, often near the very tips of the growing parts of plants. So near the tips of roots, and the tips of what we call shoots, or kind of the branching above ground portions of plants. And there are very specific clusters of cells. With, those are the only places where cell division happens. Once cell division happens, the growth of cells usually occurs by elongating existing cells. And that's where actually most of the physical linear growth of plants happens. It's not just by adding a bunch of tiny little cells, but it's making little cells grow and become longer kind of more rectangular and sometimes extremely rectangular in shape. So you get a chance to see that um, in a future class. When you go into Take Botany, you'll be learning more about plant growth and plant cell tissues. And you'll get to see some examples of that. All right, but back to talking about the process of cytokinesis, all right? Dividing the cytoplasm in plant cells is very different because plant cells are bounded by a much more rigid, less flexible cell wall made out of cellulose and sometimes other materials. And so you can't just pinch the cell in via the membrane because 
the cell membrane is located just inside the wall. So there is a plasma membrane. There is a phospholipid bilayer type membrane just inside of the wall of every plant cell. And if you just pinch that down in half, that would create two daughter cells, but then they'd be trapped within a larger box. And that doesn't really separate them very well. So instead, what plant cells do is that they begin to secrete new bits of cell wall material in isolated deposits near the center of the cell using very specialized forms of Golgi bodies to create vesicles containing cellulose. And then eventually all these little particles fuse together kind of in the center region of the cell forming a structure that we call a cell plate. And initially the cell plate is just kind of suspended within the cytoplasm, but it can continue to grow and expand along all of its edges until finally all of the edges fuse with the existing cell wall. And then we create a new cell wall dividing our nuclei that had been formed. Those are now split in half. All right. Now at this point, the cell can continue to grow and it can actually add more cellulose to both of these daughter cells and again grow larger and longer in many cases. And that's kind of the way that plants have to deal with it because again this external structure. Now again other species they also have other forms of cytokinesis. Um, Again, if you take some more upper division classes or more specialized classes that look at this process, you'll probably learn more about them. All right. And with that, we're done. All right. And just about perfectly on time. Only got about three minutes left. So again, for those of you who are watching live right now, if you've got any questions, now would be a good time to kind of type those up and uh, throw them my way real quick. Um, otherwise, you can uh, post for any questions that you have, um, either in the general discussion thread on our Canvas shell, uh, which is a little limiting because that's limited to each of your individual lab sections. So you can post a question there, but it only goes to your lab mates. Um, unfortunately, there's no real workaround on that. Um, but you can uh, address that, and of course, you can just individually email me questions if you don't want to post them. Uh, for the benefit of the rest of the class. All right. Okay, question comes up. After exam two, when will exam three be? Again, I honestly can't tell you right now because I don't know what the district has planned in terms of continuing remote instruction or not. My hope is that we would return to normal classes and um, I don't plan on moving exam three. I'll probably keep it to the same date. Even if um, we do continue remote instruction, I will probably keep that date as scheduled. Um, and as long as I'm keeping up on the lecture material, um, we should have everything that you need and ready to go. This is kind of a really short unit. We've only got about two and a half weeks before um, that exam is supposed to be um, kind of scheduled. And we're going to do that. You are not going to fail. Be a little confident in yourself. You know, you just got to study, take your time, and you got to believe in yourself. Most important thing is just have confidence and just give it your very, very best. All right. You're going to do fine. All right. So with that, I think we are done here. So... Got all of that. Yep. We're good in there. So um, again, keep up all the good work and eventually I'll start getting all everything that you've graded, uh, quizzes and everything like that um, have all been received and I'll start scoring that and getting your grades up to date. So that, good luck with your exams and I will be back live with you on Monday at one o'clock. I'll see you all then. Good luck. <laughs>